Our first speaker uh, currently serves as Deputy Executive Officer for CalPERS, where she's been since 2010. Uh, previously, she was Managing Director for Health IT at legal and consulting firm Manat Phelps and Phillips. Uh, and before that, she served in the Schwarzenegger administration as Undersecretary for the Health and Human Services Agency and as Chief Deputy Cabinet Secretary in the Governor's Office. Please join me in welcoming Ann Boynton. Good morning. Is that out of the way? Um, thank you, Bill, and good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning, and I, I hope that uh, you find some of what, what I have to talk with you about this morning of interest. First, I want to take a little bit of a poll. Uh, it helps me sort of understand uh, who the audience is. For if, who here considers themselves to be an IT professional? Who would consider themselves to be a program professional but interested in data analytics? See, we need so many more of you. I mean, nothing against the IT people, totally, but we need so many more on the business side who are interested in data analytics. Um, so this morning, I'm going to focus on how CalPERS, California Public Employees Retirement System, of which many of you may be members, um, uses data analytics to provide the information necessary for business intelligence that we then use for strategic planning and making better business decisions. With all the positive changes and attributes, of course, that come with business intelligence, there are a couple challenges that we've encountered, and I will uh, talk with you a little bit about those as well. Before I go into that, though, a few words about CalPERS, just to sort of set the stage for what we do. Certainly, uh, we do not have nearly as much data, for example, as DMV or Department of Healthcare Services, others of you who have enormous amounts of, of data. Uh, we are the largest public pension fund in the United States. As of Friday, our portfolio on the retirement side was just shy of $290 billion. Our mission is to serve those who serve California through health and retirement benefits for nearly 3,100 public schools, local agencies, and, and the state. For more than 80 years, we've built retirement and health security for people who invest their life work in the state. Our members number more than 1.7 million in our retirement system and more than 1.3 million for our health plans. On the health side, we spend about $7.7 .7 billion. We'll spend about $7.7 .7 billion this year. We issue about $13 billion worth of benefit payments on an annual basis, and of course, that number is continuing to increase. As for CalPERS itself, we have about 2,900 employees. Business intelligence, or BI as some like to call it, which sounds a little bit too much like BMI, which just makes me think that we all, that I need to go out and do some more steps to decrease my BMI. Um, users of a broad collection, uh, uses a broad collection of knowledge, skills, processes, practices, and technology to extract information from a wide variety of data sources for strategic decision making. The beauty of BI is that it, that it creates insights which enable an organization to take a holistic view of information for enhanced decision making. There's a premium placed on timely, reliable, and accessible information, which, as I noted earlier, we're able to get because of our business intelligence work. Getting the right information to the right people at the right time is crucial to making decisions that affect our members, employers, the board of administration, and our CalPERS reputation. Benefits of BI include timely and enhanced insights into member needs, innovative approaches to services, deeper understanding of the impact of market trends, and comprehensive assessment of proposed legislation and policy changes so that our decisions are well informed. To help illustrate the use of business intelligence, just a, just a minor, uh, a little bit of a side note here on it, something from American Airlines. One of the challenges I think we face in government particularly is finding ways to make these kinds of, uh, that something like business intelligence come alive to our decision makers. And I find it useful sometimes to draw parallels into the private sector. So the challenge that American Airlines was looking at was that fraudulent ticketing 
had um, produced a neg had negatively impacted their profits. A BI solution was developed to go quickly through and analyze huge amounts of data. The airline was able to expose fraudulent ticketing and save $5 million. That's a savings, obviously, to, to the airlines, but then also to customers because the, uh, for ticketing reasons. As part of our ongoing strategy to remain a leader in pension, health, and financial in industries, CalPERS is determined to evolve its behaviors, skills, and knowledge. This change can best be described as a shift to a more analytic-minded organization, though it's much more complicated than these simple words might lead you to believe. Business intelligence was identified as a discipline that could assist our organization in this shift. In 2011, CalPERS initiated a, an enterprise-wide business intelligence strategy to evaluate the current and analytic needs of the organization. A five-year roadmap was developed with the goal of incrementally maturing our BI program. With a collaborative partnership between program and technology, CalPERS is using BI for strategic performance, tactical analysis, and enhanced operational services for our members and employers. Today, the program makes information more accessible for improved decision making by using advanced analytics to accelerate research, <clears throat> to create strategic performance dashboard for measuring our progress on our strategic plan, and enhancing service operations. Also in 2011, we launched MyCalPERS. I know that some of you in the room still have nightmares about MyCalPERS, and for that, I apologize. Like Helpers is a, a new transactional data system combining 109 different data systems into one. As you can imagine, a project of this tremendous scope and complexity presented a few challenges. On the data side, some of the le de legacy data was flawed, largely due to lack of entry filters, and not all of the 109 systems are seamlessly. The conversion from legacy systems to MyCalPERS required a lot of patience and hard work. Another challenge was documentation, not, not, a, not a surprise to most of us in the room. Capturing how the legacy systems were being converted to the new system, capturing data variable definitions such as their meaning, structure, and values, all critical aspects of understanding your data if you want to begin then to translate that into information. As we implemented MyCalPERS, we built a data warehouse with analytics in mind. Before D BI, data was collected in different systems and traveled through a validation process where analysis for decision making <clears throat> was conducted in silos. The impact, of BI, the impact BI has on timely decision making can best be understood with an example from our Center for Innovation. Before business intelligence, research analysts Research analysis to support CalPERS health strategies, particularly our annual rate negotiations, was managed in multiple spreadsheets and took days to accomplish. The business intelligence team developed an analytic environment, largely in SAS, but also in Oracle, <clears throat> that enables the Center for Innovation to perform analysis in seconds to minutes rather than weeks. The accurate and timely information will be invaluable to CalPERS as we negotiate health plan rates uh, for, with our Contracting, agent, contracting health plans. One of the main benefits out of our BI program <clears throat> is that as we as an organization have a much better ability to do quick analytics than we ever have had before. We've developed more than 22 initiatives over the past three years. Of the five initiatives you see on this slide, let's take a closer look at the last one, payroll audit analytics. Prior to business intelligence, the information was collected and managed in various spreadsheets. The BI team developed an analytic self-serve reports for our uh, Office of Internal Audits to support the ability to perform employer audits and identify payroll spiking. These reports help CalPERS identify high-risk employers and agencies and avoid potential abuse activities. In the end, this helps us address cost issues that are associated with high final compensations. Now that you, I've talked a little bit about BI at, at a broad level, I want to take three specific examples of what we've done with business intelligence at CalPERS. Our first question is related to industrial disability retirements. 
should CalPERS move public agency disability retirement process in-house? And I know that most of you don't even know what that is, so I will try. This is the challenge of business intelligence. I will try to explain that to you. To answer this question, CalPERS staff considered the IDR determination process, which can be very time-consuming. They also wondered if the complexity, if complexity is a factor in the length of time it takes to make a determination and whether a single determinator, specifically CalPERS, would be a better solution than the current construct. Industrial disability impacts safety members of our service who are um, injured on the job and then retire earlier than would be a normal service retirement due to um, injuries that have been sustained as a result of their work on the job. So for us, CalPERS makes the determination for IDR applications for state members. The application review, the medical determination, <clears throat> all of those, the entire process. Public agency employers do the same thing for their IDR applicants. Staff analyze the data by employer type. So state, schools, public agencies, all of us have safety officers, and member type, miscellaneous and industrial, industrial and safety. IDRs occur with uh, CHP, other state safety and public agency safety members, so we looked at the analysis in those groups. What we found was that the IDR rate doesn't actually vary significantly among the three groups. Staff found some anomalies in public agencies that appeared to have a bit higher uh, rate of approval of IDRs, more the exception than the rule, not enough that we would say we needed to take over, propose to take over that responsibility, uh, but something that we then put in our conversations with those agencies as they look at their own IDRs to begin a conversation with them about the process that they're using and how they're making those determinations. So should CalPERS move the IDR process in-house? The answer is no. There's no real advantage for us or our public agency, contracting agencies, for us to have done to do that. Our next question is about sick leave conversion. Are there erroneous sick leave conversion records? And if so, what is the scope of that issue? So upon retirement, CalPERS members can convert unused sick leave to service credit. Not annual leave, don't get excited, all of you who are using annual leave now. Sick leave credit can be converted. <clears throat> Which of course translates to um, 12 sick days. Most people get one sick day a month when they get it. Uh, 12 sick days a year. The sick leave conversion is the number of unused sick leave days by 0 .004, and that gives you the conversion into years. Uh, a member, as it notes, has to work almost 21 years in order to accrue a full year of sick leave. What we found when we looked at the data is that some members had more leave than we thought was actually possible based on our information on their service records. Um, it's a good thing to find out. It's better to resolve them. So one member, for example, had uh, 15 years, as you see, uh, 15 years of service and a, and a year of sick leave. And it's not possible for that to happen. So it gives us a platform to go back to the back into the ranks and talk with our folks, the retirees and their agencies about what's going on. Sometimes there's an explanation for something like that. Um, sometimes it's just flat out an error and it's good to find those errors so that we can uh, review and correct the records as necessary. Uh, as noted, we did not find this to be a large uh, widespread issue, which calmed our executives considerably. Um, <laughs> and we, were, and we uh, set about correcting the issues when we found them. To correctly answer this question, though, it took a true collaboration between staff representing different disciplines across all of CalPERS. This particular BI issue <clears throat> involved folks from IT, our research division, and the business areas as well. And although we're fortunate to have an enormous amount of this talent in-house, building such a team presented certain challenges, in particular finding people with all of the right skill sets then growing them and nurturing them into their continuing roles. Business intelligence requires individuals with strong analytic foundations that include a knowledge of statistics, analysis, and a keen understanding of the data 
Also, we have to have technical staff who have the ability to use business intelligence tools. So you thought that first description was about the IT folks, but it's not. That's why I was asking who here is in the program side and really interested in data analytics, because that's the area that as organizations we really need to continue to grow as we uh, proceed to expand our use of data as a problem-solving tool for us. So the answer? Are there, some, are there some problems in the own in sick leave conversion? Yes. Is it enormous and widespread? No. It's something that we can tackle on an incidental basis and begin to resolve. So the final question I want to talk with you about is related to our health area and is, uh, talks about regional health care costs. How can CalPERS evaluate regional health care costs? As I noted early in my introduction, we provide health benefits for the state of California, for the CSU system, and also for about 1,400 um, agencies who can contract with us, public agencies, cities, counties, mosquito district, you know, vector control districts, water districts, who can choose to count, contract with us or not. So unlike many aspects of uh, what we do in state government on a regular basis, in this area, actually, I have to compete with the private sector in, in a very real way because there are brokers all over the state who want the CalPERS staff uh, want the CalPERS business on the regional basis. So remaining regionally competitive is incredibly co important to us. Beginning in 2005, uh, we told our health plans uh, to begin regionally pricing their contracting agency rates for basic uh, un for non-Medicare pre plan premiums allowing us then to better compete in areas of the certain areas of state, particularly Southern California, which has a much more competitive health care environment than we have in Northern California. So uh, we really wanted to differentiate that. Counties with similar costs were grouped into regions, taking into account historic variation, enrollment, coverage areas, and geography. CalPERS staff analyzes the relative cost by county to determine if the regions uh, should change, and we do that. We update that periodically. We did it just recently, and that's what uh, this will show you. The approach that we took for this was to analyze the cost of care by county. So staff calculated the expected and actual cost per subscriber, so that's per person who's authorized by the state to have services taking into account then the county population. And we compared those costs to a statewide cost. So we took every single individual record in our contracting agency, uh, in our claims database related to our contracting agency, every single individual, looked at their, how much money we had spent on them over five years, risk adjusted out how sick they were, so it was really a comparison of cost to cost, and then aggregated that information up to the county level to figure out what should the cost have been and what was the cost. Many of you know as a, that far better than I how enormous the, the enormous amount of data it takes to cover a state like California. Um, and I have brought you an eye chart today to talk about a little bit, oh, just 19 counties of the 58 that we had to evaluate. Um, so it's just a portion of the analysis that we did. The geographic regions are in the far left-hand column, and then the, the counties next to that. Moving toward the right, you see the expected per subscriber per month and the actual per subscriber per month. So the, the expected per subscriber per month is what should it have cost, and the actual is what did it actually cost us. And then the very far right column shows you what is that variance from what should have been what the, the statewide average. Some counties you see, um, not those of you in the back of the room obviously don't see that, um, those of you at the front see <laughs> they vary um, one county up around 1.81 uh, and then Sacramento County at 1.01. So wide variation in the Northern California area of what should those costs have been. The beauty of BI is that CalPERS employees are able to present very complex information in a digestible, easy to understand format for our decision makers. As a result, we can turn data into useful information for our board, allowing them to have relevant information that uh, will allow them to make knowledge, fact-based decisions. 
So we proposed a changing. We had at that time proposed some changes to our contracting into we currently have five regions. We, uh, based on the data that we had, suggested four. But the slide that I showed you previously, the eye chart slide, is not very conducive to actually helping a decision maker make any decisions uh, about what they have to do. So this slide takes the proposed contract, the, the regional analysis from the previous data table slide and plots it in a more user-friendly state map. The relative cost data is displayed in a green to red color scheme, something people can easily access when they think about things. Uh, and the pr four proposed regions are very difficult to see, uh, but they are outlined in orange, blue, purple, and yellow. The next couple slides I'll take you through uh, show different ways to think about this that also makes it easier to describe. This slide takes out the counties where we had membership of uh, less than 0.5% of our membership lives. I don't know if I can make it go back. Oh, yeah. Okay, so see Inyo County down there right above the green San Bernardino, and then it's red, and you would think, oh, my gosh, it's a giant area, and it's red. That's got to be really, really bad. Well, in fact, less than 0.5% of our membership lives there, so it's sort of a noise and can distract from the real decision-making. By pulling out the noise, which is what this allows us to do, we can focus on the areas that really have uh, the highest cost and highest impact, not surprisingly, um, that's... That's the Bay Area. This slide then took the information about where changes could be and looked at what are our current rates and said, based on what we know about our rates and what we know about what the changes would be proposed, what's the likelihood of an impact to the actual rate, the premium that people are going to pay? So that's what it describes, the potential premium impact by county. The dark green indicates a noticeably lower potential impact, and the red shading, again, go with what's simple, relates to noticeably higher potential impacts. So the, that swath of the center of, um, the center of the state would have had noticeably higher impacts. Uh, for those of you who are just dying to know why that is, because move, we moved to Kern County, and you'll see that Kern goes green. The lives in Kern County were, were supporting the, that swath of the state at this point in time. But anyway, so that's, it's a great way to make ease, decisions easier for, your, uh, for the decision makers when you present data in a graphical format that they can easily access. So after extensive data analysis, the answer to how can CalPERS evaluate regional health care costs was we can eval analyze health care costs at an individual level and aggregate it to the county level so that we can determine where we need to make, where we should uh, recommend that regional lines be drawn. So in closing, I would just note that it's, imp it's important to remember that business intelligence is a relatively young program at CalPERS. It's a program that requires commitment from the entire organization and is integral to our strategic planning. Business intelligence is a new way of thinking that considers both the business and technical sides of CalPERS. And that transition, for those of you who have tried to go through it and are starting to go through it, is incredibly challenging. It's a, it's a deep cultural change within an organization uh, that the likes of which you, you should not underestimate the challenges of moving that forward. We anticipate a lot of work and growth ahead and think of it merely as a journey as we evolve ourselves into a risk intelligent organization grounded in analytics and evaluation. Uh, I will stop there, Bill. And thank you. Thank you, Anne, for that terrific presentation. Uh, if you have questions for Anne, uh, save them because we're going to have a, a panel discussion with Anne and our other panelists, uh, led by Shell Kolb. Uh, so uh, I would like to, at this time, introduce Shell. Uh, Shell was uh, appointed as Chief Deputy Director of the Office of Systems Ingr Integration in 2011. Uh, at OSI, she directed the largest IT project and program portfolio in state government. Over the past 20 years, Shell has served in a number of high-level positions, uh, including CIO uh, in, in various departments, and uh, 
Shell is retiring at the end of the month, although she tells me she's not going away, uh, but we are very lucky to have her today. Please welcome Shell Cole. Am I on? Can you hear me? Thank you, Bill. That was uh, uh, a nice introduction and makes me feel very old. But um, So I'm going to uh, uh, do something that makes me feel even a little bit older. How many people in the audience uh, started out as a student assistant? Okay, about, about a quarter of you. So about 34 years ago, um, I, was <laughs> I was a student assistant for the Department of Water Resources. And my job as a student assistant was, um, this is kind of a, you know, Mr. Peabody in the Wayback Machine now. Um, I, I don't even know how many people know who Mr. Peabody is anymore. <laughs> uh, okay, thanks. Um, my job was to plow through mountains, and I mean mountains, of blue bar and green bar. Does everybody remember what that looked like? And I was picking out, what was that? <laughs> still got it. Uh, some people still use it as doorstop material, but um, my job was to plow through mountains of, of blue bar and green bar and pick out small little pieces of data relative to crops. And the kinds of data that I was looking for was, uh, first, the type of crop, whether it was onions or garlic or green beans. And I still remember the acronyms that we used for them, oddly. Um, but I was also looking for how much fertilizer was applied to that particular crop and how much water was applied to that particular crop, because we were looking for yield. Um, and what we were trying to do was build a model for the demand for water on the state water project um, at the Department of Water Resources. So uh, you might have gathered, I was not in technology at the time, but I was, uh, you know, my, my background is in economics, so I was uh, uh, an economics student looking to build this model for the demand for water. If you think about it, that was um, sort of early data analytics. You know, we were looking at data in order to use data in a way that would help us do our business better, which is what Ann was talking about. Business analytics, fundamentally, data analytics is about helping you do your business better. So uh, 34 years later, we're still talking about analytics what it is, how to use it, um, and how to uh, make uh, better decisions with, uh, with data and how to drive our businesses into um, uh, better efficiency and effectiveness. So we've assembled a panel of people here today to consider some of these questions. I would like to invite uh, everyone in the audience to um, it might be a little difficult for those of you in the back, but uh, Bill uh, assures me that he will have a microphone uh, available. But we'll, we'll have some time at the end of the panel for all of you to ask, quite, well, maybe not all of you, but some of you to ask some questions. Um, so be thinking and writing down what the kinds of questions are that you want to ask of the panel members. Um, so we, we've, uh, we've got a, a several folks here that have some experience with data analytics from a number of different perspectives. So let me, let me tell you who we have. Um, first up, I've, uh, I've known this, uh, this gentleman for a number of years, um, Chris Cruz, um, Department of Healthcare Services, the largest uh, department in our agency, Health and Human Services Agency, by far collects the uh, most data of any one of our departments. Chris is, is one of those very dynamic and visionary guys who has been able to look at his business of technology within a, a larger business of healthcare services and figure out how he needs to position his business in order to uh, effectively support the business of healthcare services. He uh, manages currently the largest portfolio in the, um, uh, in the agency, in any one of the departments of the agency except for Office of Systems Integration, of course. But it's over a billion dollars. So let's get Chris up here and, um, and welcome Chris to the panel. Um, and we will, uh, I'll, I'll also uh, introduce the others. But come on up, Chris. We'll start getting this rolling. The second individual. I'm going to try and look at this phone while we're doing this so that I can, um, yes, right over here, thanks, so that I can time us. Uh, the second individual here is Scott Gregory. 
Uh, Scott is our Geographic Information Officer for the State of California, the first of his kind. Um, and, uh, you know, another old story, you know, back probably 20 years ago, we've been working on GIS in this state for about 20 years. Uh, and there was, an, uh, there was a, uh, an effort underway that Caltrans was leading at the time to, uh, to be able to put together all of the state's geographic information uh, and data. Um, it's stalled and it, it got revived and stalled again, but um, Scott has been doing this work now for uh, a couple of years here in the state, but over 18 years um, in uh, uh, developing GIS implementation. So let's welcome Scott up to the uh, panel. And then last but not least, we're going to welcome Ann back uh, because she has a unique view of um, business intelligence and uh, data analytics. And let's kind of kick this off with a, um, uh, a question for Ann. Um, Ann talked a little bit about uh, Mike Halpers and, uh, and its business analytics um, uh, efforts. And I think that, uh, you know, CalPERS might enjoy a little bit of an advantage with how it views data and how it collects and manages with data than maybe some other departments where it's a little bit less obvious, like perhaps healthcare services. I'm not going to put words in Chris's mouth. But, um, <laughs> but, but, given, that, uh, but given that CalPERS is um, maybe a, a little bit different, um, Anne pointed out the need to develop more people with a view towards data. And uh, I think the popular vernacular these days for those folks is data scientist. Has everybody heard that term, data scientist? So those of you who raised your hand as being from the program area and, um, and working in data, how many of you would consider yourselves a data scientist? So three. <laughs> Um, and Anne also mentioned that we have to develop a lot more. So Anne, tell us how CalPERS uh, addresses that. Um, you know, how do you develop uh, data scientists and folks who are interested in looking at data across your organization? Um, and then Chris and Scott, um, you know, I might ask you guys to, to opine on that as well. So go ahead, Anne. Thank you. Um, uh, CalPERS, I, I think, does have a little bit of an advantage in, in some of that uh, because we are so driven by metrics on the investment side. Uh, the, I think I, I rounded up the number and said it was approximately $290 billion as of Friday. The number that was in my notes was much more specific than that. So our investment folks are very data driven, very used to benchmarking every single day that we have enorm a huge amount of staff who focus in that. I think not that the investment staff are doing any of the rest of the analytics, but it, d it, is, it does help to have one portion of the organization that's so intensely driven by data analytics to help the rest of the organization start to come along a little on that understanding. Um, there's unfortunately no sil silver bullet, as you all know. It's about looking for people who are curious who have the right kinds of analytic mind, and mine is not one of those, to really d drive into data and understand what the data is trying to tell you. Um, so intensely curious people who have a lot of fun rolling around in numbers and, and thinking about things from different angles are really the people that you need. And you do need to spend some time with your HR unit thinking in a coherent fashion about what are the classifications on the state side, what are the classifications that we need to bring in and in what structure, and how are we going to integrate those folks and give them a career path so that they're willing to stay in a largely program area where, but doing things that aren't exactly going to be in an AGPA, SSM1, 2, 3, and then, and then I get to be a CEA kind of structure. So look at things like your research scientists. Look at other kinds of um, research program specialist series is a really good series to think about. They have the kinds of skills that, they, that you need and, and can be built into an, organizational, an organization's structure, but it has to be done very carefully. 
So, so Scott, you're, uh, I can see that you're reflecting on that as, yeah. as Anne is talking. Does it, do, do we have to have a separate classification for data scientists? I know that's been thrown out. Uh, you know, some people have suggested that you know, maybe we need a new uh, focus. Um, and and uh, you know, maybe Anne has some ideas, too, about whether or not CalPERS has considered that. Right. Um, yeah, I, I think there needs to be kind of a rebirth of how we look and approach uh, data analytics in the state. And it, it, it's no, uh, no secret that data analytics is core to uh, geographic information science uh, and the use and application of it. But what we found, at least I've found in the, in the three, almost four years, almost four <laughs> years that I've been with the state, is that a lot of the job classifications are antiquated. Uh, many of them were developed back when folks didn't even know what GIS was. Uh, the internet wasn't invented, right? So uh, one of the key initiatives my office is taking on this, actually this year, and it's, it's very appropriate that Ann mentioned, uh, collaborating with CalHR and looking at how we can update some of these classifications to retain talent within the state, is looking at a revision of how GIS jobs are classified and how they're, uh, how they're filled. So I can, in the future, build um, a workforce that's gonna wanna stay. You know, there's a lot of internal knowledge here um, within, within the state that we really lose when that leaves. And by providing a pathway from uh, student assistant to technician to specialist to analyst to a managerial role that's focused on data analytics. For me specifically, obviously, I focus on GIS, and that's, that's, that's core to what we do. But following that thread all the way through will build a very strong from bottom up workforce uh, that will ensure integrity in how we analyze data, uh, will help us speak that common language that's germane to all of government, which is, which is geography. So I'm excited about that. We'll, we'll see how that goes. I'm, I'm very ambitious and very, um, well, I'd say confident uh, that we're going to make some headway there. Does it help? Um, maybe this one's more, more for Ann. Does it, does it help to have a, uh, a, a business uh, in state government like CalPERS that is focused on a bottom line that is uh, defined by dollars? I think, I think all, of, all of us in state government are focused on the bottom line of dollars in different ways. I, mean, I, I think people have a misperception that at the, at the state, we aren't terribly cost conscious. Um, anybody who's ever written a BCP knows how cost conscious we all have to be at all times. Uh, I, I don't know that we have any significant advantage just because we have a, a very private sector-y looking aspect to our organization. In the end, our goals or what everybody's goals are for any state government spectacular customer service in all the things that we do for all of the Californians that we serve. And that's no different than any other state agency has. Okay, thanks. Let's uh, switch it up a little bit now. Um, you know, in, in technology land, we're pretty famous for our jargon. Uh, you know, sometimes I think our, uh, our, our business partners uh, don't necessarily understand what we're talking about when, when we're talking. Um, so I, I, I would like to ask Chris to kind of help us level set uh, the difference between data analytics and big data, since uh, big data is, uh, you know, that kind of uh, uh, popular term on the scene now that seems to have materialized out of thin air, but we all know in technology that it's, it's basically it's taken 34 years to get there, right? We've been talking about big data for a long time. And so this concept of the, of the nomenclature is something that I'd like to invite Chris to kind of help us understand. So what's, Chris, what is the, uh, the difference then between data analytics and big data and what's the relationship that you see uh, with it in healthcare services? And <clears throat> those are good points, Shelley. You know, in data analytics, I look at those as the tools that enable the researchers to look at data, out data outcomes and also to look at fraud, waste, and abuse and other things that they're working on from a programmatic perspective. And you know, at healthcare services, we have an enterprise debt program based on our enterprise architecture perspective that we're looking at consolidating our business intelligence or data analytic tools into a common platform. 
And I think what that will do is enable us to look at big data. And Did you look, say enterprise debt? I look, yeah, enterprise debt. Maybe and you can explain that a little bit. One of the things bit. we're looking at in our organization is we have multiple tools that have redundancy and functionality. And we're saying in order for us to be more efficient and effective in how we manage data and how we distribute and disseminate data, we need to consolidate those tools into a common platform. So one of my goals at Healthcare Services is not only to uh, consolidate those tools, but be more efficient and effective in our ROI and how we spend dollars. And, and to me, if we can do that and get our researchers on a common platform, then we're now looking at a single source of truth and how we proliferate data and how we disseminate data to our stakeholders and constituents. So that's one thing that we're really looking and working hard on. So my EA and our new chief medical information officer, we now have an interesting dichotomy that we're driving enterprise governance across both business and IT and at the research level to get those people into a to effectuate change within our processes. When I look at big data, I look at the way that we store our data. We have what's called an MISDSS data warehouse, very similar to what CalPERS has. And within that data approach, that's our single source of truth. All of our healthcare data goes there uh, for uh, uh, substance abuse, for mental health issues, for uh, provider information. And we want to take that information and we want to share that across organizations. And we think if we can get to common data analytic tools and common shared services and a common infrastructure platform, we can take that data and offer it to other departments and sister departments within our agency and also transcend this throughout the state. So that's what I look at how you can transform, transform big data. Um, big data is how you store it and how you disseminate it and how you share it. Because a lot of the organizations in the state, we collect the same data in multiple applications. So again, getting down, consolidating, taking a look at shared services will help us get there in terms of dissemination of big data. And also getting our legal people to draw up common standards, common processes, and have a streamlined and standardized data release process will help us do that as well. So I want to come back to the uh, enterprise debt <laughs> idea uh, because uh, you, know, you, you kind of threw that out there. But uh, can, you, can you say more about enterprise debt as it relates to data? What, you know, how, how does data help you? manage that? Well, again, the important thing is rolling that data into one streamlined application because when we did our uh, as-is enterprise vision for healthcare services, I was presented with this uh, very lengthy and comprehensive graph that showed we have multiple tools that collect the same data and are used by multiple different people. And the issue that we have in the department sometimes is reconciling our data. That's a big issue. And so we looked at how can we have an area where we can go to the department director or agency secretary to say, we're confident that this is the data that matches uh, industry trends and what we need to do, both to our federal partners and to our state partners. And so that really got us thinking about, we, we can't continue to live with multiple tools doing the same thing. Uh, the data outcomes are different. The research, uh, researchers are kind of segregated throughout the organization. How do we roll them up into a federated model and give them the tools and also be more efficient and effective on how we cost allocate dollars across hardware and software. So that's where we came up with this enterprise debt program is to say, how do we consolidate our application systems? How do we consolidate our business intelligence tools? How do we look at common platforms for the things that we do across the organization, both from an information perspective, a technology perspective, a business perspective? So it, it kind of all runs together. I could spend all day talking about uh, enterprise debt, but uh, it lays out our fundamental approach on how we're dealing with data analytics and how we're going to deal with big data in the future. So your enterprise debt is then something that is, uh, is not adding value and maybe even subtracting value from, uh, fr from your um, uh, enterprise IT architecture. Right, and what uh, we're finding is that we're spending a lot of money in maintenance fees each year renewing these licenses for a small subset of people. And uh, we want to consolidate that, eliminate that debt, take those dollars and repurpose those in other areas that are more of a priority for the department. So if you extend that across the enterprise of Health and Human Services Agency, how do you see that notion of enterprise debt sort of playing out across the agency where we have multiple departments collecting and storing the same information uh, multiple times? I mean, how, how do you see that, um, you know, that concept being uh, impl uh, implemented across the agency? Well, I think you, know, you can take the me same methodology and concept that we put together, implement it across the agency, but again, it starts with shared services. It starts with an inventory of the tools of each department, coming up with an as-is vision, and then looking at those commonalities across the organization to look at tools that we can leverage at that enterprise level. And also, sh uh, common infrastructure, I think, is really important, that we start looking at a common infrastructure for all the things we do within our agency. 
and maybe that's common data center look, you know, we have service virtualization today, it doesn't matter where servers are located. I think once we start partnering and identifying where there's commonalities in data, we can uh, integrate those servers and make it easier and more effective for folks to, uh, to access data from those systems or system as opposed to multiple systems. So that's where we'd start, I think, looking at common platforms and then looking at common standards across the organization, both from a tactical perspective and a strategic perspective. So um, Anne mentioned in her uh, remarks uh, uh, in, in, about CalPERS and how uh, it, it, the data that CalPERS collects is, um, well, it, let me get, go back a little bit. She, she mentioned about my CalPERS, which I happen to love, by the way. And, oh, and you know, Bill mentioned that you know, in my retirement, I've, I've had a lot of uh, opportunity to use my CalPERS, and I've been thrilled. Excellent. Um, so I, I actually love that. Um, so, Scott, you have a very interesting view on all of this, you know, from a geographic information officer point uh, of view. And, you know, you live with data probably more than any of us live with it. You know, what are you seeing in terms of challenges that departments have in managing with data like CalPERS and maybe, uh, you know, now we throw this enterprise debt notion right. onto right. the pile. You know, how, what, what challenges do you see in trying to, you know, get to something that's more streamlined, efficient, and effective? Sure, sure. Uh, excellent question. And it, it, it's interesting how all these different initiatives, whether, whether it's with Chris or with Ann, kind of all blend into this, this big pot of how we, how we focus on solving some of these larger problems. Uh, some of the items that my group has identified um, uh, have really focused around three areas, uh, data redundancy, um, uh, attrition, uh, folks leaving, and then what's authoritative? What's an authoritative data set? Um, a couple years ago, we initiated a project called the State's Geo Portal. And what the State's Geo Portal uh, was to accomplish was to articulate the state's geographic data resources and make it a, a, a portal that's a one-stop shop for folks to search, discover, and use information. Uh, we accomplished that. It's, it's live. It's running. Um, but one thing we discovered initially was the vast amount of redundant data, redundant systems, um, which was troubling to me. So it made us really look at data as a, an investment, as infrastructure. And that's sort of a paradigm shift in terms of looking at, well, you know, I'm just managing data. But it truly is a resource. And then it leads us to the question of, well, what's authoritative? What can I use to make decisions off of? You know, data that we manage and develop as a state turns into information that hopefully is actionable, that people can make decisions off of, that policy can be determined off of. Um, that's where we have to begin to look at determining the definition of authoritative data. So for, for us, for in, in, in the world of GIS, we've, we've come up with some, some cursory definitions for that, and I won't, I won't bore you with that. If you'd like to talk more about it, well, we can talk after this. But it's really allowed us to focus on what's important. From what department should we be propagating this information out for use? Um, then it comes to that, that sort of doomsday view of attrition. You know, we have a huge amount of attrition, whether it's through retirement or folks leaving and looking for other opportunity uh, uh, in other venues. When those folks walk out the door, all that knowledge leaves with them. Uh, and that's no surprise, right? Uh, when I was with the federal government years ago, uh, we were told that, there, that uh, uh, the organization that I worked for with the Department of Defense was in the next five years going to lose one-third of its workforce through attrition, whether that was retirement or leaving. That's scary. Uh, so we need to think about ways to capture that and understand that environment. Um, so how do we do it? Um, I think we need to be very creative. Uh, for us, we, we're looking at the development of statewide policy and standard around how we document information, how we steward information, how we curate information. Because it's not just the state that's, that's, you know, we're not all just looking at each other for the answers. It's also local government. It's also to some degree industry. What, you know, what's the state's demands on how we'll deliver information if we're industry to, to the state? Uh, these are really, really important factors that haven't been addressed specifically in the, in the area that I manage and oversee. Um, but we're, we're, we're working on that. We're working towards that goal of putting guidelines around how uh, the state interacts with that information, how the state manages that information, and how we care and feed for that information, specifically around geographic data. 
So what do you, uh, I, I know that you're sort of casually involved with some open data initiatives at the state level, yes. uh, which is an area of passion for me. Uh, so so how, do you, uh, how do you bring this notion of open data into that discussion of, uh, of, of kind of curating the state's data, you know, and, and this notion of is, is, the state the pers is the state the entity calling the shots or are the people who own the data calling the shots? Hmm. Good question. I, I think it's a shared responsibility, honestly. Uh, you know, the, the best data always comes from the source, right? It comes from the department or it comes from, uh, you know, the, the local government that might be reporting up to the state. Um, for, for us, uh, and, I, and I guess I, I might even speak personally, my feeling is that, that gover government is not always the sole provider of the solution. It's a shared responsibility between citizenry and government. We need to understand the needs of citizens to be able to deliver on those needs. Um, so opening up a participatory dialogue between uh, citizen and government in relation to data is extremely important. That's what many of the open data initiatives going on in the state are, are, are looking to have at its center and as its focus. But going beyond that, how do we then provide a platform for access to authoritative and relevant information for citizens to make decisions off of, or business to make a decision off of, or, gosh, even government to answer its own questions? Uh, that's, that's, again, at the core of what we're determining uh, in the future of what open data will look like in terms of policy, in terms of how information will be disseminated, and in terms of the platform. So I think we'll come back to open data uh, a little bit later because I think it um, uh, has some important uh, implications for how we, how, how we develop our programs and how we develop, um, how, how we serve our constituents. But let's go on to this, uh, to, the, to the notion of, uh, of, of getting it done. This is where the rubber meets the road. Uh, you know, how, how do we, how do departments, um, put together or implement a, uh, a program with uh, business intelligence or with, by, with managing by data, with performance uh, management. And this is not the individual performance management. This is uh, an organization's performance management. So what would we consider, and this is for you know, anybody that has, a, has an opinion here. I hope all of you have an opinion. You know, what would we uh, consider to be our, our perfect future? If we're building our perfect future around data and managing with it and being uh, as efficient and effective as government could reasonably be, reasonably? No, just <laughs> as efficient and effective as government could be, what would we see happening between now and nirvana uh, that, that we would uh, need to manage around? So you know, what, are the, what are the barriers? What are the things that we can do to build upon efforts? Uh, and you know, how would, how would we, what would our perfect world look like? Well, I can take that, actually. <laughs> yeah. I definitely have an opinion about this. You know, I think obviously, again, and I mentioned it uh, the last time, in terms of the enterprise debt dissertation, is having common processes in place, having our legal people develop policies that are streamlined across the state for data dissemination. I think that's a common issue. The data release process, having an enterprise data release process, maybe having the ISO's office sponsor that or the privacy officers sponsor that, and really have those discussions at that business level first to help drive that. I think that that's really important because I believe at the technology level, that's pretty easy to do. You can devise and come up with a plan. It might take time, but there are strategies in a place that um, are successful. It's getting the policies and, and you know, the people in place in order to do that. I think one of the other areas, too, is we've got to get out of the sandbox theory that we have in the state about it's my data. It belongs to DHCS. It doesn't belong to anybody else. I'm not going to share it. And here's 100 reasons why we can't. And I think that will, the streamlined policies will drive a lot of that. But, you know, as Scott mentioned, we're becoming a much smaller organization in the state with a number of retirements are happening, both in the business area and in the technology area. We can't afford to go on like this. And so we have to put our heads together to effectuate this type of change. And shared services, as we've talked about before, having common platforms for data, having single systems that either through data warehouses that collect data and move it forward. You know, I'd like to see a partnership with CalPERS with their data warehouse moving forward. So we're collecting the type of data. They're collecting health data, we're collecting health data. You know, we collect data on fraud, waste, and abuse, so we should share that with Department of Justice. 
So it's really about a bigger conversation on the technology side and on the business and policy side to start having that dialogue. That's what I would like to see in, a, in my nirvanic type world. So I mentioned that we would um, you know, come back to the open data uh, thing and that we, that we didn't get too far away. Uh, how is open data going to, uh, you know, to move this conversation along? Hmm. Well, uh, I, I think in a, in a number of ways. One that comes to mind um, particularly is, you know, we think of open data in, in you know, to, to the, to the non-technical person, th think about the audience. There's, there's many different audiences. Um, you know, I always, <laughs> I always try to um, think of when I, when I develop uh, applications or have staff develop applications, I need, to, I need to keep in context that, you know, my mom's going to use this someday. She, she knows how to turn the computer on, bless her heart, and she knows how to, you know, go on Pinterest. But, <laughs> but, but it, it needs to be accessible um, to a level where it's relevant. And we, we, I always share this notion of uh, data converted into information is only relevant when it touches the lives of individuals. Uh, if we can keep that in mind and, and, and think of open data in that context, what ways do we operationalize that data? What ways do we put that information in the hands of people that can make decisions off of it? The people we serve. Um, I, I think that's a really interesting notion. So taking, taking this idea of vast amounts of information and distilling it into, into common and understandable ways, whether that's in a, a mobile app that's very easy to use, whether that's in a dashboard that distills vast amounts of information and puts it into very simple, understandable metrics, or a map. A little biased in that degree, but I think uh, <laughs> geography is one of the greatest ways to convey information. We saw it in Ann's presentation. You know, how do you conceptualize that, that eye chart, right, as you mentioned it, and you put that to a map? It begins to change the dialogue. It begins to change the understanding. So looking at intuitive ways for us to share information, uh, again, I think is at the core of how we convey the importance of open data in government. I think one of the things that's important as we sort of look toward that the nirvana state is uh, understanding a clarity of end point. There, there is no end to the number of people who want information from government, as we all know, and particularly anybody who works in responding to any PRAs. And the definition even just of what is a PRA now is so different than what it was 10 years ago as we look to finding, making our data accessible and our information accessible to the outside world. But for those of you who are in the IT world, how many of you have ever have built an application that you thought or someone else thought was going to solve the world's problem and nobody ever uses it, <laughs> right? It's the clarity of end point and understanding why do we want to do what we want to do. And really, as, Chris is, as, as Scott's saying, what's, what's the end, what are we trying to convey to the people who are going to be the ultimate users of this information when we get there? Otherwise, I think we risk spending an awful lot of cycles doing a lot of analysis and producing things that in the end don't serve the people of California in any way. And that's a hard, I'm not, I don't mean to, think, to say, make it sound like that's an easy thing to do. It's, I think, one of the single most difficult challenges in front of us is trying to understand what's the clarity of the end point so that we know that we are marching with precision toward that. That's a, that's a good point, Anne. Um, and my, my understanding is from the open data movement across the country, if not the world, is that we're going to get some help with that real soon. So we have uh, you know, uh, several billion more eyes on data uh, that we collect. And uh, as, as Anne points out, um, you know, the, the Public Record Act request has, has morphed over time and taken on a whole new character. So uh, what, what we sometimes fail to consider is that, uh, as Scott pointed out, data is an asset that, uh, that we hold in the state, but it doesn't really belong to us. It actually belongs to uh, the, the people who pay our salaries, essentially. And that asset is now being used for uh, very clear economic benefit. So there, the, the, the data that we collect and hold is an engine of economic benefit to be generated. Um, 
and it's happening across the country. Uh, other states, uh, California is very nascent in, in, in our open data efforts, but across the country, other states have uh, fully embraced open data as a way to generate economic activity and to, to get at what, what Ann points out, uh, you know, what, what are the right things to be doing? What are the right programs to be, uh, uh, to be uh, working on? What is the right data to be generating? Uh, and, and all we really have to do at this point in time is pay attention to what that market is telling us. Um, now, having said that, um, you know, there's probably some data that we wouldn't release. You know, my, my personal information is not open to anybody as far as I'm concerned. Um, and, you know, that's, that's not the, uh, the definition of open data. Um, but government is very fond of, uh, of creating PDFs, right? Um, and, you know, PDFs are pictures of data that aren't uh, you know, particularly useful as we're looking at, um, uh, at analysis. So not sure how many of you uh, uh, data folks in the audience would prefer to look at a PDF or something that's machine readable that you can suck into uh, you know, some sort of an analysis tool and, and crunch that more uh, in, a, in a more automated fashion. Um, okay, so uh, I'll get off my soapbox now on open data. <laughs> um, uh, and and let's, let's, uh, let's get to this uh, question on um, uh, efforts around uh, analytics in the private sector, which are uh, very commonplace, uh, pretty much a, a matter of, uh, you know, course of business for medium and large size companies. Not so much in the, in the smaller companies, as I'm finding, but... Um, uh, there, there seems to be uh, a very robust and mature um, analytics capability in the private sector, which kind of tends to cast a negative light on government's efforts on this, in this regard sometimes. So how do we deal with that? How do we address that uh, uh, situation? And do you see any ways that this can be, you know, that our acceptance of this kind of uh, technology can be accelerated? I think we, we need to create, part of what we need to do is create an environment, and it's very challenging in government, create an environment where it's okay to fail in what you're doing. It's important to ask questions and realize that the vast majority of the time the, quest, the answer that you're going to get is not the answer that is going to solve the problem. And because, I th in part, I think because we are under so much uh, potential scrutiny, a private sector company, nobody knows what they're doing inside those walls. We have a different kind of world that we live in. And I think that freeing government employees in particular to fail at the analytics that they are doing and not suffer repercussions for that is an important part of uh, getting people energized and uh, about the anal analysis that needs to happen. I think Ann makes a good point there that we can't have these as punitive actions and we can't worry about being on the front page of the Sacramento Bee for all the wrong reasons and that we have to take these risks and move forward and be able to have mitigation strategies in place to minimize some of those failures. And I think that that's really a big piece is you've got to encourage and empower your employees and it's a team. It's an army of many and not an army of one. So you need to leverage your research people. You need to leverage your business people and your technology people and bring that talent together to come up with these types of ideas and then develop these common policies that will allow us to streamline progress and be able to measure it and manage it. And, and I think that that's really important. I, I think, you know, you touched upon open data. If we can come up with a state with a common platform, right? I mean, we're starting to look at that now um, from a state perspective of having all of our systems under a common launch page. And maybe we can move forward from there. Somewhere we have to start small and we have to figure out how we're going to take those baby steps and get those into incremental steps that we're able to measure progress to move forward. We have to be able to do that. We need an executive champion to be able to do that and move it forward. It starts with sponsorship as well. And as Ann said, not um, you know, a gotcha every time something happens or something uh, falls uh, short of expectations. I think that that's really important. So you, you, that sounds a little bit like a culture shift. It is. So well, say some more about the culture. I mean, this, this, is, this is a different way of thinking it is. for a government. And, and we have to. I mean, I think we have to think like a private sector entity. I know at healthcare services, I'm very fortunate that, you know, the director is giving not only accountability and responsibility, but authority to make some decisions and move the department forward. And I think if we can do that at a statewide level, we're going to be much better off in the way that we do business. You know, we're bringing new millennials into our environment. 
they have a different way of thinking. Um, I know in my office, I'm very transparent. They come in and say, hey, you know those ideas you have? That's great, but here's what you need to do better. And so, you know, a lot of times we're not, you know, very open to that type of feedback, right? And so I am, and I encourage that type of feedback in my organization, and I think we need to do more of that. We need to get these folks to the table that have these talents with new technologies and people that have great ideas on how to use the Internet and how to use mobile apps and dashboards to be able to be more successful. We need to open our arms our, and our eyes and our vision towards doing things differently in the state. And if we really are going to transform government, we need the type of change agents in the positions of leadership in which to do that. That's my personal opinion. Well, who are those people, though? The, you, know, who, you said you, we need an executive sponsor. Who is that? Well, you Isn't know, that you? Well, yeah. I mean, I'm an executive sponsor in my organization, and I'd love to be an executive sponsor and help from a statewide perspective. And, you know, I, I'm there to help. And I want to be a partner, and I want to be a collaborative partner, because that's what it takes to be able to move the state forward. So I'm looking for people with that common vision who have great ideas to be able to illuminate and effectuate change. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think uh, I, I couldn't agree more with Chris. I also think we got to get out of this notion of building yesterday, tomorrow. This idea of, um, of not having a future view of uh, the idea of not looking at government as operating like a business. I mean, our, our revenue is a lot different, right? Our, 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 our focus should be, should be on the folks that really pay our salaries. Um, and and dri dri driving IT, driving data, driving application development towards meeting the needs of that constituency is, is really, really key. Um, you mentioned private sector. I think there's a lot to learn. Um, I think there's room in the sandbox. I really do. Uh, I believe that Public-private partnerships is what drive value to the citizenry. We can learn a lot. You know, this idea of collective intelligence, I don't know if many of you follow kind of this stream of thought. Um, MIT has an entire center developed around collective intelligence. It's this notion of, of multiple eyes, multiple minds focused on one issue, one problem, but they're not all solved by, um, by a, a common intelligence base, meaning that it's not all IT professionals or all administrative professionals. It's professionals from the entire community, the entire culture that come in to solve issues uh, that might happen to pertain to open data or might happen to pertain to IT. You know, we don't have all the answers, I believe. I think we have to work together as a, as a group. Problem that we're trying to solve and how are we jointly going to get there, which is way overly simplistic, but I think sometimes, as I said, I think we do make things we use a lot of words and a lot of jargon and we make it way harder. If you go back to the example that you were giving, Shell, at the beginning, you were doing data analytics. It's not like we don't do data analytics, for heaven's sakes. It's just that right now, some of the stuff that we need to look at is locked away in a server somewhere and I don't have a key. <laughs> so how do we change that so that as a program person, I can talk to somebody who can help me find the data that's locked away in that SAS server, wherever it is, or Blade, or whatever those things are. I don't even know what they are. <laughs> but it, it's, it's, it's the same. It's a SAS server, I think. It, it's, <laughs> it's, it, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's that different than where we, what we've been doing. We're just trying to evolve our thinking about how do we get at the information that we need, because it used to be in my ledger, and now it's not. Right. So you, uh, you, you raised some good points there that tie back to some of the things that Chris is talking about with um, you know, kind of shifting the culture, uh, you know, make it possible for, uh, for failure to happen. I would add, you know, fail faster so that you can recover mm -hmm. faster. Um, how do you, as a business executive on the program side, um, value that, uh, you know, value that notion of failing faster, you know, of, uh, of uh, being creative, of approaching things maybe differently. I mean, you know, we, we do have that bottom line to watch after, right? So, so what's the value of that to you, and how do you look at it? I'm not looking for a dollar sense, but, you know, kind of Yeah, I think, uh, is there anybody from CalPERS here? I should ask this before I say anything. Somebody in the back raised their hand, just put it timidly. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> Way in the back. So I, I, think, um, I think you could ask, my, ask our staff who are here, um, I, I think that CalPERS as an organization and certainly the position I have tried to take with my staff is um, go for it. I mean, try it. It's, we're not, I can guarantee we won't get any better if we don't do anything. And even if we fail, we've learned what not to do the next time out. So we will be more intelligent as we go forward. 
so I think giving people the latitude to use the incredible intelligence that we as a state are honored to have in our staffs and, and let them think about a problem and go forward and fail if you need to, succeed the next time or the time after that or the time after that. Um, I, I, don't, I, I hope that that's what my staff would say that they find in, in how I relate to them around innovation because we've got to make change. And I think at CalPERS we've made enormous amounts of change in the past five years. Some of it brought on by external circumstances uh, relative to how we conduct ourselves. Some of it by the 10-year journey that they, we were on to implement my CalPERS, which was a lot about partial failure and, and then an enormous success. So I, I think we could go on forever here, but um, I, I, I want to, because I could certainly you know, pursue that line of questioning uh, with, with a number of questions. Um, let me uh, open it up at this point in time to uh, questions from the audience. Oh, there's one. That was a fast hand. That was, there's a couple. <laughs> Hello, my name is Pamela Rosada. I'm the Administrative Officer for the Interagency Council on Veterans. Thank you so much for everything that you had to say today. You bring some very salient points and some things that we're looking at. Um, Chris, I especially liked what you had to say about being fearless and sharing data in a meaningful way. And veterans provide you the opportunity to kick open that door for sharing data that you're looking for. One of the things that we've discovered on the Interagency Council on Veterans over the last couple of years of meeting is that there would be great value, as I'm sure you understand, in being able to see what happened in the past with some of the veterans that worked through our educational system, that worked through our healthcare systems, et cetera. One of the issues that we have, of course, with veterans is that it ebbs and flows, right? Well, right now we're post-conflict, we're drawing down. For the next seven to 10 years, we, have, we need a heightened awareness of veterans in our system. For example, one of the things we're trying to do for our hardworking service members is create a career ladder to nursing for them. Well, when we went back to the educational institutions earlier this year and said, hey, what'd you do with that workforce investment money that was supposed to be targeted at veterans? They couldn't tell us how many had applied. They couldn't tell us what the roadblocks were for them getting in. They couldn't tell us why they didn't complete the degrees. They couldn't even tell us how many did because we don't have the right data. Open sharing is happening all over the place. The problem that we had in Bell, California a couple of years ago has opened up a whole new way for open data to be used. If we just start collecting and sharing information on veterans, I think we'll experience a broad-based savings across the board on healthcare and other things. Paris showed us that matching system that if we just look into the Medi-Cal records and find those that are eligible for VA, we can save money that way. Well, there's a lot of other ways we can save money. I'm going to have 10 more seconds here. Presumptively connected service disabilities. That alone is life changing. One woman in particular had been in the Marine Corps, never made it out of boot camp. Her pelvis was crushed. 33 years she lived on $600 a month in disability, never thinking she was eligible for any kind of benefit through the service. Well, she had a presumptively connected disability. When we finally convinced her to apply for her benefits, she was given a 100% disability rating that came with health care, so now she's no longer on any kind of state service, and it came with a $2,800 a month living stipend. Sharing veteran data is key. We have groups getting ready to form now that are looking at creating these matchings, these, these portals between data, connecting things better. The vets have a process going on. I'm going to be handing my business card to each of you up there today and reaching out to you to see if we can get you in the room at least once to hear what we have to say and maybe bring you in so that we can broaden your coalitions and achieve our mutual goals. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. for that. Go ahead and give the panel a chance to respond to that. Oh, I definitely would love to chat with you about that again. I think if we can take this data, especially with Medi-Cal data and healthcare, it would be really important that we could integrate that and find some commonalities, either through data analytics or just, you know, uh, invoking and implementing common interfaces. It would be very helpful. Yeah. Agreed. I agree. We have one more question here. Michael Cave, State Treasurer's Office. Good morning, everyone. My question is on quality. We've talked about analytics. We've talked about decisions. How do you know when the quality is high enough? Uh, you're dealing with uh, health care and people's retirement, so decision makers, they have to have confidence in their decision making, so how do you know when you've got the high enough quality to do that? It's a great question. I, I, I think the, the, the idea of quality uh, and confidence in information 
is at the origin point of that information. If an organization feels confident enough to share that information with the public, they're standing behind it. You know, when we talk about open data, and I can speak about open data in particular around uh, GIS and the, and, and the broader efforts in the state, um, our focus for the state's geo portal was that one of the criteria for having information cataloged and resourced within that was that uh, it met your internal uh, checks and balances for what's a valid data set coming out of your shop. Out of Chris's shop, it's going to be a heck of a lot different than I would assume coming out of Ann's shop. Um, but I believe it's up to the organization. This brings up an, an, another kind of interesting point, is that we need to take ownership for our information. We have a stewardship, uh, and that stewardship is to build and develop relevant information based on taxpayer funds. And I think that's, that's incredibly important that we stand up and be counted and be responsible for the information that we put out. And I think some, to some extent, I think the answer to how, how much quality do you need is related to the question of what are you using it for. So from our shop, for example, uh, the internal auditors may be looking for essentially rough order of magnitude differences. Penny precision is not as, as not as important for them necessarily in that. If I'm trying to identify an agency that I think may be doing some, uh, some reporting on their payroll that is problematic, I'm looking for big differences. On the other hand, if what I'm trying to do is when our actuarial shop is making projections of what do agencies need to pay for every single individual who is going to be covered under CalPERS, they need a higher level of precision because people are budgeting on a daily basis on that information. Um, same, you know, extend that to when our retirement research folks are doing analytics to determine something like the IDR or the sick leave conversion. Then it's pretty important that we have fairly accurate data. Uh, so I think it, it depends on what's the question that's being addressed and how good, obviously we'd all like perfect data, but it's not going to happen. So figure out what are the issues that you're trying to address and how important is the data quality to the specifics that you're looking at. And I think in quality, I know at healthcare services, one of the things we've looked at is quality of data within our audits and investigations program as we combat fraud, waste, and abuse. So one of the things we constantly talk about at DHCS is preventative-based outcomes, right? I mean, we can prevent fraud rather than um, pay and chase. We have 175 paid uh, peace officers at healthcare services, and they're constantly out in the field trying to apprehend suspects. So now with the quality of data and what we've done with data analytics and bringing in more mature tools now, they now have the data, the quality of data, to make those informed decisions at the, at the initiation stage rather than at the execution stage. What it's going to result in is really uh, the five, three to $5 billion we think we spend or, or fraud, waste, and abuse incurs in this state. Maybe some of that cost and revenue recovery will come back. Uh, by using these tools and, and, and managing and relying on the quality of data. Another question over here. Uh, my name is Jose Ramos with Hewlett Packard. I, I want to first uh, start off and thank um, each of you for a little gem that you've given me and my understanding of, of data analytics. I, I like the authoritative data stuff that, Scott, you've come forward. It kind of matures the concept. And enterprise debt, Chris, is, is a, great <laughs> it's a great way of looking at things. Um, and I want to go to something about locked data and, and unlocking it, um, and maybe even bring in Shell a moment here. Um, we live in a society that's kind of schizophrenic about debt, I mean about, about data. We kind of figure that we um, don't want our personal information shared, and at the same time we uh, openly opt in in social media networks to giving everything to Facebook. And so I'm, my question is how does the state see a future of sharing personal health data for those citizens that want to opt in um, for perhaps a de-identified form of their data to advance their own self-interest to say research. Because as the society ages, uh, a lot of people are going to want uh, new forms of medicine. They're not going to get it if we lock the data away. So I'd just like to hear your views on how we're going to surmount that uh, schizophrenic future. Thank you. Well, it's good that you asked an easy question. <laughs> uh, I think. <laughs> um, and, and let the record show that Anne has a Fitbit on. So she's already transmitting her uh, personal data uh, somewhere. Just the number right? of steps that right. I take every day. 
Uh, or well, I don't know what else they collect. I, I don't pay any attention. It's just to try to keep me uh, doing something. So, um, you know, the whole question of personal health information is incredibly um, difficult at its core, for, even for us to deal with. And we've got an enormous federal regulatory structure that deals with it and an enormous state regulatory structure that deals with it that doesn't even have nice clean buckets that say health data is health data, right? Mental health data is not the same as health data. And those two pieces uh, are very, actually, you know, very not necessarily always allowed to exist together. Um, I think to the extent that people, and I agree, it, it is kind of, uh, it's, it's amusing to me in some ways. I get, people send letters, I love retirees. I, I do, I love them. But they, they release the most intimate details of their lives, of their personal health situations, to their friends. And, and then their friends write to me about the problems that, they're, they're, that uh, the retiree is having and want me to respond to them <laughs> about what's going on with that person. And uh, I have to gently remind them that um, I would be in violation of federal law were I to do that, and that it's fine that your retiree friend wants to tell you all of the details of their hip replacement, but the minute I talk to you about that hip replacement without a release from that individual, I'm in violation of federal law. And it's a process of constantly reminding ourselves, you know, where are the stop points that have to happen by federal law? I don't I am not a medical ethicist and don't know, I mean, we don't, I have medical researchers, but I uh, have no brilliant answer to you on that other than it's something that we have to continue to figure out how to push those bounds. But at the same time, if I'm willing to sign away all of my information, what's the risk level that I'm willing to accept that that information could become de-identified and you could find out that I have a bunion on my big toe in, in the end. Um, so it's a risk calculus for the individual who wants to have that data released as well, I think, that we need to be uh, informing them of. So, so I would add to that that there are efforts across the country um, at uh, uh, opting in with your medical home. Uh, so that, that the, the type of research that you alluded to, for example, um, dementia in uh, early stage Alzheimer's, uh, the, the information that, that I might be uh, acquiring on my own diagnosis, which hasn't happened, by the way. Um, <laughs> Too much I, sure. I, I could check off. Of, I could check off a box saying, you know, would I permit this uh, information to be shared yeah. for the purposes of research? And you know that that is actually uh, you know happening in, in in some places, mostly within a physician's practice group. Uh, but the fact that it's happening means to me that it's uh, you know it's, it it will become uh, uh, a movement. Now it. it as Anne you know, points out, it can't be something that is uh, broadly applied to people who have not opted in. But the opt-in uh, option is becoming a reality. It's, it's much easier with adults, obviously, because you know, we can make decisions for ourselves. It gets really dicey with kids. And that's where you know, Chris pointed out a lot of uh, uh, issues around confidentiality as, as it relates to people who cannot make decisions for themselves. I think we have time for one more question. There's one over, one over here at the front. Thanks for getting to the side of the room. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Anna Kula from Department of Health, I mean Child Support Services. <laughs> um, you knew there or just weren't yes, there? Yes, I am new there. So. <laughs> um, and my question is, um, this agency um, is just beginning the BI um, initiative. And so from, from those that have done this, what are your lessons learned or what would you have to say for those starting off? I think that's an Ann question. Yeah. I think Scott's got great. I, I think some, some of the things that we've, um, I, I think it's important to sit down early and think about what's your long-term strategy, what are the business areas that you want to focus on with this, uh, what are the incremental steps that you want to take? Um, are there easy wins? 
build confidence in the staff who are beginning to work in this area so that uh, they see that it's possible. Uh, as I said before, talk to the HR folks, really think about how are we building this on the program side. On the IT side, it's, it's a little easier perhaps because of the classification structures, but you're, you really want the program to be deeply embedded in the business intelligence. And uh, so thinking about organizationally, how's that going to work and how are we going to manage our projects across the organization um, as a start. Yeah. Maybe a little culture shift thrown in there as well. I mean, I, I, I know that there are departments out there that own BI tools that don't use them. Um, and, and I believe that they don't use them because they don't have that culture of, you know, what are these things for? What can we do with them? It's just another sophisticated database management tool. Um, but it, it really is a culture shift. Yeah, and I think from that culture shift, if you look what we've done in DHCS, now we have a dedicated organization that just handles BI, and it's not the CIO. When I came to healthcare services, the CIO was also the person to manage data. And so those lines of demarcation have been drawn, and I think that that's really important as yeah. a lesson learned, if you will, to be able to leverage a dedicated organization with those type of resources. I think we're about at the end of our time. I think we're, uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Uh, thank you to our panel, Ann Boynton, Scott Gregory, Chris Cruz, Joe Pope. Thank you.